Hello and welcome to Hot and Heavy, the Elaine Venice podcast. I'm your host, Shivani Desai. Today I'll be talking about Season 4, Episode 15, The Shoes. Hello everyone. Um, this is a tough, tough day to record. Um, for those of you who might not be listening to this uh, around the release date, I'm recording this the Thursday after yet another massacre, um, mass shooting, this time at an elementary school in Uvalde, Texas, where 19 nine and 10 year olds were massacred and slaughtered, two teachers as well. And um, it's, I don't know what to say anymore. I've said a lot. This country is failing, not only these small, small children, but every single person who has died because they were grocery shopping or attending a movie or in a mall or doing everyday things that everyone should be able to do because this is the land of the free, right? But no, we live in a country where guns are protected and more important than human life. Even Even a child's life, a child sitting in his or her classroom, even those kids, these assholes who refuse to do anything, don't give a shit about anything except their power, the money that they get from the NRA, all this fucking bullshit. They don't care. And these are the assholes who say they're pro-life. It's... It's too much. It's been too much. But in the interest of not completely breaking down and making this into, you know, an episode about the sickness of gun worship in this country, I'm just going to say if you're as pissed off as I am and as just scared to death as I am for not only yourself, but everyone, please text ACT, A-C-T, to 644-33 and get involved. There's Moms Demand Action. You don't have to be a mother. (laughs) It's uh, just the name of the organization, a fantastic organization. There's Every Town, another organization. I feel hopeless. I feel hopeless every time this happens because what will it take? What will it fucking take? All we can do is try to vote out these soulless monsters who will not do anything about this. Who continue to say, eh, it won't work. More uh, stricter gun laws won't work. Well, what the fuck will work? Are you doing anything? Are you doing anything? <sighs> um. So that's... uh. You know what? Just get involved as much as you can. I do my best. I will admit that sometimes it takes a toll on my mental health because I just feel like it's such an uphill battle. And it is. More The more guns we have in this country, I mean, the statistics are there. There are facts. But these are the same people who don't give a shit about facts. These are the same people who don't believe in science. These are the same people who say racism isn't a thing in this country. So you know what? Fuck those people. And let's move forward with the people. And there are a lot of us, a lot of us who recognize the fact that having a Second Amendment also means that we need to ensure that the people who want to have guns are people who are responsible, are not mentally ill, and who take it seriously. Look, I'm not, I'm not sitting here saying we need to come door to door and get all your guns because that's the narrative that the fucking gun lobby pours down the throats of these people who are too stupid. I'm sorry, but too fucking stupid to know any better. So all we can do is keep fighting. 
That's all we can do. And it's scary because you're fighting against psychos with guns. I mean, that's why this is a scary cause to really put yourself out there for. And I'm not saying that I, I, I wish I was braver to do that with more gusto. And um, I guess I'm doing that a little bit. But um, to the 14 people listening. Um, but you know what? Just get involved. That's all I can say. Vote out the people who are just not listening and who will just keep taking money from the NRA to prop up their own power. And um, they don't because they don't care. They've shown that over and over. They've shown it over and over. You can slaughter, slaughter, slaughter little babies in their class who are just trying to go to school. And they don't care. Because if they cared, they would do something and they would find a way forward to help us, help people who don't want to be scared to send their children to school, who don't want to be scared to go out and do normal human things without a possibility of someone with a fucking military grade weapon shooting everyone. Okay, I'm moving on. <clears throat> well, it's been a roller coaster week because um, at the beginning of the week, I um, this was kind of what I was planning on talking about, like the big thing I was going to talk about um, because it was something kind of significant in my life. Um, I am an admitted hypochondriac. Um, and I'm not proud, but I did sort of put off, uh, getting a mammogram for a couple of years and, um, you know, I waited longer than I should have. And with a lot of things in my life, especially with my health, I wait until something scary is happening. <laughs> and then I'm like, I better get to the doctor now. Um, yeah, it's my own, <laughs> my own struggle. But anyway, I got my first mammogram on Monday, and I'm happy to report everything's clear and looks good. I do have a cyst, which was why I went in in the first place. I felt a lump. You know, the word lump is very scary, especially when you're talking about your breasts. For any of you out there who struggle with the same thing that I'm talking about here, just kind of being scared of going to the doctor or getting yourself checked out or whatever it is, ignorance is not bliss. I've learned that over and over again in my life. It's better to know. It's better to just um, deal with whatever's going on in your in your uh, body. And you know what? Let's just get into this episode. Um, I feel like lately I'm offering up this podcast to be a distraction from just how fucking awful the news and the world is at the moment. But I wish it was better. But um, um. It is what it is. I'm sorry. This is going to be a really emotional episode. I'm just trying to kind of get through it because I want to get this done. I need the distraction as well because I'm, you know, doom scrolling because I don't want to not see the pictures of these little beautiful kids. <laughs> these beautiful kids who are doing nothing to deserve what they got. <laughs> and don't ignore it. <laughs> Don't bury your head in the sand. Look at these kids and these two teachers. Look at their faces. Read about them. They deserve that much because we failed them. This country is failing over and over. And these kids just wanted to live. And this country failed them again. Sorry. Um, I'm trying to get myself together here. All right. Um. The synopsis for The Shoes is as follows. George jeopardizes the NBC pilot after NBC's president catches him looking at his daughter's ample cleavage. Jerry enlists Elaine and her cleavage <laughs> to help rescue the project, unwittingly causing Dalrymple to fall in love with her. Elaine refuses to reveal where she bought her new designer shoes. Jerry's frigid ex-girlfriend kisses Kramer. This episode is written by Larry David and Jerry Seinfeld. Well, the phoning it in synopsis writer <laughs> strikes again. There is a lot of inaccuracies, like Jerry enlists Elaine and her cleavage. No, doesn't happen. Elaine refuses to reveal where she bought her new designer shoes. No, she reveals it. Wow. Phoning it in synopsis writer. That sounds like a good sketch. All right, we start out in Jerry's apartment. George and Jerry are on a roll writing the pilot. They've got their little notebooks and pens out. Oh, they're laughing. It's funny. It's funny. 
And then they realize, oh, we haven't included the Elaine character yet. Okay, well, Elaine enters. And they just, they can't write anything. What do women say? I don't know. And then Jerry just says, you know, if they bring in the Elaine character, it'll be too many people to keep track of. Kramer, the butler, you know. All right, forget Elaine. Kramer enters and tells Jerry that he snubbed Gail Cunningham. And Gail is a woman who wouldn't kiss Jerry after three dates. And Jerry is so appreciative of it. Not that he condones snubbing, but he loves Kramer's loyalty. Next, we're in Monks. Elaine throws the script to Jerry. She's annoyed. She's not even in the pilot. And Jerry uses his lame excuse that he couldn't keep track if they brought her in. You couldn't keep track? And then he finally, he just has to admit, we couldn't write for a woman. And she just looks at him. What? I mean, even now, I know you're going to say something. I have no idea what it is. You have no idea? <laughs> Gail enters and she comes in hot, asks Jerry why Kramer snubbed her and tell him that I'm mad at him. <laughs> All right. Elaine tries to eat Jerry's sandwich and he's like, what are you doing? I thought you were done. I took two bites. Anyway, she also starts coughing. And so Jerry points out that she's coming down with something. You want me to get sick? The actress who plays Gail Cunningham is Anita Barone. Now, she's a familiar face to uh, many of us, I think. Sitcoms all throughout the 90s she's appeared in. And just for me, selfishly and personally, she has a Michigan connection. Uh, she got her BFA from the University of Detroit and her MFA from Wayne State University, both Detroit universities. Pretty cool. She's also married to an actor from Saginaw, Michigan, and my husband's from Saginaw. His name is Matthew Glave, and he played the part of Glenn Gulia in The Wedding Singer, the jerk fiancé of Drew Barrymore's character, who would have been Julia Gulia if she married him. I like Anita Barone as Gail. I think she's pretty fun in this role, and it's a fun part to play. You get to interact with the whole cast, and you even have a really um, co uh, confrontational scene with JLD. I really like her a lot. She's talented. Back to the scene, Gail notices Elaine's shoes. Ooh, where'd you get them? They're, um, Botticelli's. Ooh, look at you. I'm afraid to go in there. So Gail leaves, and Elena's not happy. Ooh, Botticelli's. Oh, she's so embarrassed about Gail and her reaction to her shoes. And Jerry's confused. Really? That bothered you? Yes. Can't you see that? No. This is why you're not in the pilot. All right, so the purpose of this scene, we... Really, we get to see Elaine's involvement in the story here. And my take, I, I do like that Jerry admits to Elaine, like, hey, we just didn't know how to write for a woman, which further makes the case. Hello, Elaine is a writer. <laughs> she could have helped you guys. <laughs> she is also an editor who edits writers. Oh, my gosh. It's just this blatant dismissal of that part of Elaine's character. Ever since contributor Greg pointed this out, uh, at the end of last season, it bothers me so much. She was writing a sitcom script. She was writing a Murphy Brown. She can help with this pilot, guys. Ugh, so annoying. And also, life imitates art here. Um, as I've mentioned before, the writers for Seinfeld were all male writers for a period of time. And they did struggle to write for Elaine until they got the direction from... Mr. Larry David to just write her as a guy and, uh, you know, don't even think about the gender, which ended up working really well. The interaction with Gail that pisses Elaine off is really well done. I think it was a really great example of something that a man would just be so neutral about um, from the outside. And that would really like I, I see where Elaine's coming from. You know, it's embarrassing for her. And there's definitely passive aggression from Gail here, like implying Elaine may think she's better than her. And again, I, I'm coming at it from a woman's point of view. So <laughs> I've had many of these in my life, many Gales in my life. In fact, recently, <sighs> there's a mom at my kid's school who, I mean, I could have a two second interaction with this woman and it's somehow there's like a, there's a veiled insult with everything she says. <laughs> and I think it's just her personality. I try not to take it personally, but um, yeah, it's tough sometimes. We were talking about outfits we were buying for our daughters and I said, oh, I bought my daughter something new for this event at school. And she asked me where like very similar to this. Oh, where'd you get her outfit? And I said at Nordstrom. 
Now, mind you, I know that sounds fancy dancy, but I always start out at like a Target or an Old Navy. I don't know. I don't know. I feel like I have to defend myself here. I probably don't. But anyway, she kind of, she had a Gale reaction where she was like, Nordstrom, was it really expensive? And just, <laughs> and I'm like, what? I, I stuttered over my word. I'm like, I, I, yeah, I mean, it was, not you know, for Nordstrom, it wasn't that bad. You know, like I felt this need to say, no, I'm not like spoiling my kid. I, I don't know. It was just uncomfortable. And she does this every time. All right, next, we are at Dana Foley's office. We met Dana Foley, the therapist, a couple episodes ago. And George and her are having a very good conversation. They're wrapping up their session and saying, you know, George, you've made a lot of progress. And George says, yeah, no, I, I really think I've grown. On his way out, George asks, hey, what did you think of the pilot? And Dana's reaction is, it was good. Well, he can tell right away she's hiding something. So finally she says, well, I didn't think it was funny. George gets so mad, so offended. And he tries to flex, you know, the president of NBC. You know, he he bought it. And uh, she says, you know, George, if you're going to be in a creative field, you have to learn how to take criticism. In pure, enraged George fashion, he digs in further. You stink. How's that for criticism? The diploma on that wall, that's my idea of comedy. <laughs> Dana Foley says, I think you better go. Oh, I'm going, baby. And he has a change of heart as he's walking out. He turns back and says, it's Jerry's fault. He took away all my funny ideas. He's such a control freak. All right, moving on. We're at Jerry's apartment. Elaine enters to find Jerry and George <laughs> right at the door. <laughs> And George says how, you know, this therapist that she recommended criticized the script. And she said, well, I guess she didn't think it was funny. Oh, she didn't think. Who is she, Rowan and Martin? Now, Rowan and Martin were a pair of comedians who created the show Laughing, for those of you who need some useless trivia in your mind. And George says, you know, we have this meeting with NBC and she completely shattered my confidence. And Jerry agrees and says, you know, it really wasn't her place to criticize the script, which reminds me... Elaine, you never told me what you thought. <laughs> Elaine's trying to get out of it, uh, starts coughing. As she's trying to escape, Jerry's trying to say, no, no, no. But then Kramer walks in and drops the bomb that he just kissed Gail Cunningham. What? Well, of course, that distracts Jerry from Elaine's escape. <laughs> I guess Gail even kissed Kramer back. And, and Jerry's confused. You know, I went on three dates with this woman and nothing. And she kisses you. Why? Because I snubbed her. Yes. Women like the snub. I understand women. <laughs> when Elaine comes back, Kramer says, so I understand you're buying your shoes at Botticelli's. <laughs> oh, man. Elaine's like, how do you know? Gail told him. What did she say? And she just mentioned how you're buying your shoes now at Botticelli's. How I'm buying my shoes now from Botticelli's. Did you hear this? And she does a double push, she pushes Jerry into Kramer. <laughs> Oh, gosh, this just sends Elaine off the deep end. She starts yelling, it is nobody's business where I buy my shoes. <laughs> she goes to the couch, sits down really forcibly. And I love the shot of Jerry Kramer and George just standing there stunned. Again, just this difference of like her being so mad and them going, what the hell is the big deal? So the purpose of this scene, we see the heightening of the Gale plot, both with Kramer and Elaine. And my take, I think Elaine avoiding the question about the script is very telling, considering Dana Foley also didn't like it. And I like this approach that um, no one really seems to be thrilled with this script besides Jerry and George. I think that's the only way to go here. In this type of show, and in Seinfeld, you can't make it so like everyone loves it. And there has to be that sort of struggle and um, something to create tension and neuroses, especially George's neuroses, to just go berserk. The end of the scene with Elaine freaking out about Gail talking about her shoes, it's a really fun interaction. I, I love the double shove. You know, Jerry's pushed into Kramer. And then <laughs> if you watch Jason Alexander, how he's like startled by it. It's really funny. And this is our feisty Elaine. And I really like it. Even, I have to admit, it's a bit over the top. I think the, I think this is played a little bit too much. But, you know, I'll take pissed off Elaine any day. And speaking of pissed off Elaine, her next scene is in Pfeiffer's restaurant. 
Elaine storms into the kitchen and confronts Gail about the shoes conversation with Kramer. Gail is very busy trying to get these dishes out. And her reaction is just like, I am not talking about this. This is insane, which it is. She's trying to get Elaine to leave. And as a plate of pasta primavera is being passed near Elaine, she sneezes right into it. And we see that same plate get delivered to Russell Dalrymple's table. So the purpose of this scene, even more heightening with Elaine's plot with Gail, and we see what brings down Russell and in turn the pilot for Jerry and George. And my take, we continue this Elaine overreaction to Gail's shoes gossip. I see where Elaine is coming from. I've said that before, but she really doesn't come off very sympathetic in this scene. (laughs) But I know we needed to get the sneeze onto the pasta primavera. So that's that was really the purpose of this scene. And I know the point also is not to really sympathize with Elaine. It's really, you know, to see that you shouldn't mess with Elaine or you will feel the wrath. Next, we are at Russell Dalrymple's apartment. Jerry and George arrive and Russell thanks them for coming to his apartment. You know, he wasn't feeling very well after lunch. He went to Pfeiffer's. Jerry's like, oh, yeah, I know the chef there. <laughs> then George feels the need to say, oh, my uh, my cousin was a chef at uh, Bouchard's. They used to use the bouillabaisse as a toilet. <laughs> what? And Russell says they should, you know, get this done. His daughter will be arriving soon, and she just turned 15. Oh, that's a fun age. <laughs> Jerry just looks at George like, shut up. So Russell tries to start giving his notes for the script, but... You see, something's uh, something's happening. <laughs> and all of a sudden, he rushes to the bathroom and loudly barfs, comes back, tries again to tell them what they need to do with the script, but has to run back and puke again. In walks the daughter, Molly. They all introduce themselves and make small chit-chat with Molly. Molly is played by Denise Richards. Probably one of the most recognizable guest actors from Seinfeld. She, of course, went on to superstardom in the 90s with uh, movies like Wild Things. She was in a Bond movie. Uh, And then later, for some more controversial stardom, I guess, as her divorce from Charlie Sheen took some really ugly turns in the public eye. Um, I'll be real. I've never really thought Denise Richards is a strong actress. Um, I've admittedly really not seen a lot of her work. I've also never felt the need to see her work. So uh, that's where I'm coming from. And it's really, you know, no different in this scene. She's fine. Um, I think they just needed an attractive young woman to show off her cleavage. And she she did that. I will give her props on her friend's appearance. This was after she became very famous. And she played Ross and Monica's cousin. If you haven't seen it, it's it's pretty funny. She's really funny in that episode. So back to the scene, Russell comes out again from the second puke and tells them, you know what, they're going to have to do this another time. Just please leave your number. Molly bends down to look for something in her backpack and Jerry nudges George to look over because her uh, boobies are popping out. George leers with his mouth open and Russell comes up and says, get a good look, Costanza. So next we're back at Jerry's apartment. Jerry is just yelling at George, like, what were you doing? How could you stare for that long? It was like you put a quarter in one of those metal things on the Empire State Building. All sorts of metaphors. It's like the sun. You don't stare at it. It's too risky. You get a sense of it and you look away. All very funny. George, you know, he doesn't really think it's a big deal. So he caught me. I mean, you know, who wouldn't stare at his daughter's cleavage? She's got nice cleavage. Well, that's why I poked. That's why I peeked. They see Kramer and Gail out in the hallway, and once again, Gail comes in hot to tell Jerry that Elaine came into her kitchen yelling at her. She did? And she thinks Elaine may have sneezed into someone's pasta primavera. Someone could have gotten real sick because of her. Jerry and George, after she says that, thinks pasta primavera. So they kind of put two and two together. And then Jerry gets a phone call from Stu from NBC. The pilot has been canceled by Russell. Next, we are at Jerry's apartment. Jerry is blaming Elaine. You know, if you wouldn't have gone into the restaurant to confront Gail, this never would have happened. And Elaine's not apologetic at all. I don't like people talking about my shoes. My shoes are my business. And then she points out that they shouldn't have been looking at some 15-year-old's cleavage anyway. He poked me! But she was 15! Jerry says he don't consider age when it comes to cleavage. This is on a molecular level, blah, blah, blah. 
George asks, well, what are we going to do now? He won't take our calls. And then Jerry gets the idea, you know what, we can have Gail call us the next time he's at Pfeiffer's. And, you know, the whole thing's ridiculous anyway. Like, he wouldn't stare if Elaine walked by in a low-cut dress. Well, maybe not Elaine, but someone like Gail, yeah. (laughs) Elaine just says, what? Kramer enters. Jerry says, hey, you know what, ask Gail if she would call us the next time Russell Dalrymple's in Pfeiffer's. Okay, I'll ask her right now. (laughs) And, of course, Elaine's not going to let this go. What do you mean, Gail? You don't think I could put asses in the seats? Uh, Look, sweetheart, you've got it all, but let's face it. Oh, man, so offensive. Kramer returns and says that, oh, yeah, Gail's in. She'll do it. But she wants the shoes. Oh, no. Elaine refuses. She's not getting them. And Jerry's like, come on. Look, I'll buy you a new pair. But these were the last ones of these that they had. Don't you see how everyone likes them and talks about them? (laughs) George pleads with Elaine. You know, it's not about him. It's about his mother. She's been in the hospital this past year. Yeah, because she caught you jerking off. But he cuts her off after the J of jerking off. All right. And then she says, come on, this is ridiculous. We don't even know if she's the same size. What size do you wear? Seven and a half. Yep. Of course. Purpose of this scene, we're just moving all the plots along. Pilot drama and shoes drama. It might take, um, well, I really want to focus on the fact that Elaine is the one pointing out how creepy it is that these two idiots are leering at a 15-year-old. I'm glad that they had Elaine pointed out. I mean, clearly she's the obvious choice to do this. The creeped out side of me, which is most of me right now when I think about this scene, I just wish they would have drawn this out a little bit more and would also have liked some contrition on the part of Jerry and George. But you know what? We didn't get it. I mean, I'm sorry, but Jerry famously dated a teenager while he was on the show in his 30s. So (laughs) I don't think there was going to be a lot of contrition about um, this particular incident in the show. Yeah. And unfortunately, in 1992, 1993, this was still a time where something this gross could be laughed off as, oh, men, you know, men will be men, is what I have to say to that. On to the funniest part of the scene. (laughs) I do love the, well, maybe not Elaine. (laughs) But Gail, yeah. JLD's performance is so great here. She's so offended and very self-conscious at the same time. When Jerry and George are kind of distracted talking to Kramer, you see JLD sort of looking down at her chest with confusion and and consideration a little bit. Um, So this was great setup for what happens later. All right, next we're back at Pfeiffer's. Gail sees Russell entering and calls Jerry. Oh, bring the shoes, she says. Jerry and George arrive and hand the shoebox over to Gail. They approach Russell's table and, you know, say, hey, look who's here. Yeah, we were just wondering, you know, what happened? We never heard from you. Russell's being pretty short with them, you know, it just didn't work out. Then Elaine walks by, (laughs) boobs up, hopping out. Jerry and George's reaction, they're just like, what? (laughs) We're so confused. (laughs) Back to Russell, you know, George says he takes issue with him thinking that he leered at his daughter. There was no leering. Elaine comes over and asks to borrow the ketchup. But Russell doesn't look up, so her boobs didn't work that time. So she walks over to her table and George explains that, uh, look, if something comes within the field of your vision, it's not really his fault. Elaine comes back and says that she had some trouble with the ketchup and she's just basically trying to get him to look up. Finally, he does. And yeah, he um, he keeps his eyes right on her boobs and then looks up at her face. <laughs> because if you do have a ketchup secret, I would really, really love to know what it is. <laughs> and then Russell says, field of vision, huh? Purpose of this scene, we see sort of a resolution to the whole dust up with Russell. And this is a classic Elaine scene in the series. I I love her casual way of walking in and Jerry and George's reaction is so priceless. She clearly did this without them knowing. And I think it's perfectly done that way. I'm glad that there wasn't like her having to convince them, no, no, I can do it. You know, she just, she's like, fuck you guys. You said I wouldn't be able to distract him with my cleavage. (laughs) I'm going to show you. Having Russell completely not look at her for the first couple of interactions is really funny. And I love how George and Jerry are like annoyed with her 
when it doesn't work the, that first time. But that look up, finally, when, when Russell looks up and he's sort of entranced, it's all worth it. And and I love JLD's performance when he does finally look up. She has a little smirk and then, you know, the little trace of her finger over her breast. as She's like, because if you do have a ketchup secret, it's great physicality. And, and here's some of that effortless sexiness that JLD can bring in an instant. And the comfort in what she does physically and that like timber of her voice, it all works so beautifully. Ugh. And I know this was, okay, we have to find a way to change Russell's mind for the sake of the story. But um, getting distracted by a grown woman's cleavage, who you don't know, is different <laughs> than a grown man, like, leering at your 15-year-old daughter. But I digress. This is uh, what they needed for the story. And uh, finally, we're at the last scene. We're still at Pfeiffer's, but later. Jerry, George, and Elaine are all eating pasta primavera. Gail approaches and asks how they're doing, and they love the pasta primavera. It's fabulous, very tasty. And how'd everything go with that NBC guy? Oh, Jerry says the pilot's back on, and Elaine's going out with him. Gail walks away, and then Jerry asks Elaine, you know, if, if you talk about the pilot, uh, you know, you're going to tell Russell you really liked it, right? Well, you know, she happens to have the script, and she makes the suggestion that Maybe they should have a scene where the Elaine character distracts the butler by wearing a really low-cut top. <laughs> well, they aren't sure. You know, it's a little broad for us. I'm sure it's right up Russell's alley. Well, you know, it's a funny idea. <laughs> the very end, George asks, where's he taking you, by the way? Bouchard's on 53rd. George starts coughing and choking, unable to speak. And Jerry says, I think what he means is, get the bouillabaisse. So the purpose of this scene, we resolve everything in a tight bow. Pilot is back on. Elaine has a date with Russell, which I'm assuming assuages her rage about the shoes because she's nice to Gail at the end. And my take, Elaine using her newfound link to Russell to suggest Elaine's role in the pilot is very funny. I think very fitting to the character. And again, the Jerry and George groveling to her, that's really great. Uh, the end where George... <laughs> is choking after she says Bouchard's on 53rd. It's funny, but also very confusing. Why does he want them to order the bouillabaisse after he said his cousin uses it as a toilet? I, I've i always been confused by this. I'm like, maybe I'm just not, not understanding. So I looked this up online to see if I'm the only one. <laughs> and apparently I'm not the only one. Uh, there's a whole Reddit thread about it and how it makes no sense. People were people on the thread were hypothesizing that Jerry and George want them to order the toilet bouillabaisse as revenge for Russell canceling the pilot and for Elaine being all haughty about the script. That still doesn't make any sense because Russell knows about the pissy bouillabaisse, so it just makes no sense. I've always been a little probably more than I should be irritated about this ending. Uh, this moment, though, it does make for a fantastic blooper. If you can um, look that up, they cannot get through the scene. Okay, I'm going to take a quick break and I will see you on the other side. Are you an aspiring screenwriter on the brink of greatness? Are you also a man who finds it difficult to write for women? Well, that's why you need me, Artie Brickman, in my masterclass workshop, Writer's Cockblock. We live in a woke world, my brothers. Women need to be represented in everything, apparently. So you better take my workshop to understand women. And look, it's not your fault. Women, who knows what they will say, right? But don't let the mystery of women stop you from achieving your screenwriting dreams. Writer's Cock Block is here to help you. I'll teach you different techniques on how to write a woman really good. We will watch a lot of Oprah and read popular lady books like Girl, Wash Your Face and anything by Breen Brown. I will bring in actual women so you can ask them questions. That is, if one of them returns my Facebook messages. I took Artie's workshop because my screenplay kept getting rejected. The feedback was always about the women in my script, like, oh, women don't do that, or have you ever actually spoken to a human woman? So I took writer's cock block and I learned a ton. 
Like, did you know that most women don't wear frilly dresses or even like rosé? Sometimes their ultimate goal in life isn't to be a mother or a wife. It's really eye-opening. You should take Ryder's cock block. Trust me, Ryder's cock block is the only thing keeping you from selling that million dollar script. Just email me at artiescock at cockblock.cock and I'll get back to you as soon as my mom lets me use her laptop. Ryder's cock block. Finally, you'll have something great to put in her mouth. And we're back. The extras for this episode, they only had notes about nothing. Just a couple of things here. Um, (laughs) For some reason, the cast measured their heads to see whose head was the biggest, and JLD won. Yes, she says, it's massive. My head is massive. And she says, I'm the shortest with the widest face. And so I couldn't help but wonder, uh, I wonder if that big head episode (laughs) is inspired by this. You have a big head. Another note about nothing, uh, Soleil Moonfry of Punky Brewster fame auditioned for the role of Molly. And I just wanted to point out the irony that she was auditioning for a role where the focus of basically the entire part was her boobs. And Soleil Moonfry famously had a breast reduction surgery. So uh, a lot of of breast-centric things about Soleil Moonfry. And lastly, the the whole cleavage scene at Pfeiffer's really made JLD squirm. She said talking about her cleavage was one thing, but showing it off was, was another. Moving on to Contributor Corner, Greg sent in some thoughts this week, and he says, While this episode just sort of fits in with the timeline of Jerry and George making the pilot and isn't super memorable, there are some great moments. For most of this episode, Elaine is super irritated, and I like her in that mode. First with Jerry for not including her character in the pilot, then with Gail over her commenting on the Botticellis. She plays it a little extreme, but it is so funny I allow the overreaction to a plotline that is quite dumb. The guys don't comprehend why this is even an issue, which shows why they have a hard time writing for a woman. Again, I say bring Elaine and her Murphy Brown writing skills into the team. Uh, Yes, Uh, yes, yes, yes to all of this. I think I've echoed a lot of what you said here, Greg. I'm glad you also think it's an overreaction because it, it is. But um, yeah, you know what? I'll take, uh, I'll take overreacting, irritated Elaine any day. Greg goes on to say, When Elaine confronts Gail in the restaurant, it makes me wonder how well Elaine knows her to be that confrontational. Both her and Gail are ex-girlfriends of Jerry, so this Gail must have been around a little while for Elaine and her to already know each other this well. While this Elaine anger seems totally ridiculous to me, maybe it's a female thing to be this upset about someone talking about your clothing behind your back. Elaine plays it in a funny enough way that I can overlook the fact that this seems more like a petty grievance George would have more than her. Maybe she and George are not all that different after all. (laughs) George feels judged by his therapist regarding the pilot and Elaine feels judged about where she's buying her shoes. Yeah, I think, you know, if we're talking about why this is an issue and how the men don't really see it, but the reason I do see it from Elaine's point of view um, is is that it's it's this weird judgment when and someone's pointing out to you like they're saying it as a compliment, but no, they're really just pointing out to you, hey, you're pretty fancy. You probably think you're better than me. You know, I, I agree. I understand that's reading into it, but mm, I don't know. There's something about that that is very icky. So I I, I get where Elaine's coming from. Next, Greg says, there is a major creep factor to Jerry and George with the 15-year-old's cleavage, even though Denise Richards is clearly in her 20s here. This is one of those things that wouldn't fly on TV today. It's super cringy considering Jerry himself was dating a teenager himself at the time. Oh my gosh, same wavelength, Greg. Uh, Yes, I did want to mention Denise Richards was 21 at the time. So in reality, it's not as creepy, but no, she's playing a 15-year-old and these men are clearly in their 30s leering at her. It's disgusting. Um, And yes, (laughs) I believe, God, I think, I think even like there were reports of Jerry going to the high school to watch her name was Shoshana Lonstein. I mean, I remember this because I remember it being like in the in the magazines, but not in a creepy way. It's like, oh, Jerry's girlfriend. Ooh, she's 17. Kind of weird, but oh, well, like it was it wasn't like Greg says, <laughs> very different reaction today if this happened. But 
back then it was like, look at this lucky high school girl who scored this, you know, hit TV show creator. Um, but yeah, I mean, he used to go watch her cheerleading practice on high school grounds. Gross, <laughs> gross, gross, gross. Ugh, I need to move on. There's enough things upsetting me. I need to move on. All right. Lastly, Greg says, I like how game Elaine is to test her allure with Dalrymple. She's more doing it for her own ego than to really help the guys. But when she says, you don't think I can put asses in the seats? In all caps here, Greg says, brilliant line and brilliant delivery. I've always loved that line too. <laughs> and she does a little like hip check when she says asses in the seats. Like on seats, she kind of does this little hip thing. It's cute. Back to Greg's comment. Um, her performance in the restaurant is her best scene of the episode because the attempt of drawing attention to herself is Carol Burnett level comedy greatness. Watch her eat the breadstick. I dare you not to laugh. <laughs> yes. Oh, I didn't even mention that yet. Like, oh, she gets some crumbs on her cleavage. Oh my gosh. So funny. And when it all pays off and Dalrymple succumbs to her shicks appeal, the smile on her face is pure satisfaction. Agreed. Yeah, that whole scene is just brilliant. Brilliant JLD performance. Oh, and Greg ends off saying, thanks, Shivani. Been a sad couple of days, so it was kind of nice to laugh watching this. Uh, yeah, thanks, Greg. And if you would like to become a contributor to Hot and Heavy, please email me at elainepodcast at gmail.com. My favorite Elaine moment, um, well, I love the whole Pfeiffer scene. I'm going to pretty much echo what Greg says here. <laughs> Uh, but more specifically, that very first moment when she walks in, that look on her face as she's kind of like turning and <laughs> so we can see that she, her cleavage is just uh, popping out. Um, it's so nonchalant and innocent. Oh, it's such a funny choice by JLD. My final notes, uh, lots of Elaine in this episode. And, you know, I do love a feisty Elaine. <laughs> I think it's overdone a bit here. Um, I mean, I would definitely be annoyed if I were in Elaine's shoes, pun intended, but it's played a bit too catty, even for our Elaine, a little too juvenile. But that being said, I do love JLD's performance and the different levels she gets to play throughout the episode is great. And the ending with her luring Russell in with her irresistible cleavage, it's all done so well. That entire scene is, is pretty, is pretty great. Um, yeah, but it, it sort of saves the episode. It's pretty middle of the road um, overall. And uh, I think it's safe to say that Elaine's cleavage not only saved the pilot and Jerry and George's deal, but it saved the episode as well. And I think that's all I can say about the shoes. Thanks for, for listening. And, uh, you know, I was going to apologize for being so emotional earlier, but I'm not going to apologize for it. I think a lot of us are feeling this way. And uh, again, I encourage you to get involved as much as you can, as much as you can take it. Take care of yourself as someone who gets pretty, um, as you can, as you heard, um, you know, pretty passionate and emotional about stuff like this. I also have to be like that. I don't want to become numb to anything this horrific and this unjustified. You know, um, we're just living in a very upside down time. I am hopeful for change. I know, I know things will change. And, uh, you know, we just all have to be willing to stand up and fight and vote. So um, I wish you guys some peace. And hopefully this episode helped you a little bit. Smile and laugh. Watch some Seinfeld. And then get back to the fight. Thank you so much for listening. And I will see you next time. <laughs>